Gracious Father, I ask once again that you would come into our presence to enlighten and bless us, that you would strengthen our hearts, strengthen our spirits, guide us according to your word and riches, so that we may turn to the rich life of others. We are thankful that you are a God who comes into our presence to grant to us the wisdom that we need. And so may you guide us as only you can. May you truly help strengthen us, and may you bless us as we look to you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. When many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I lie with my hands on the sea of peace, for you alone, O Lord, may me dwell on the
these texts are talking about witnessing and what God does to enable us to witness. And we see a transition. The gospel lesson actually is the first in order of a uh, time period where God is explaining to his disciples what they will be meant to do. Acts shows us what Peter was transformed and John was transformed into. They went from being men who were hiding to men now who are only proclaiming the wonder of who our Lord was. It is uh, a great example for us to show how God can take us from one place to another in the most uh, remarkable way. While the layman who was now healed clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he does fulfill. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. The time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may set in Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. The epistle lesson is found in 1 John, the third chapter, and begins with verse 1. There's a unique relationship that we have with God that gives us the ability to share that relationship with other people. It is explained in this text, and once again, John is showing us a unique perspective about who we are in our world. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself, as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Would you please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel? The Holy Gospel this morning is found in the 24th chapter of Luke. It begins with verse 36. The Gospels give us different perspectives. I, I love how the Lord gives us a different picture of the same situation. Last week we were given the situation of the disciples hiding in the room from their perspective. Now we are seeing it from the Lord's. Completely different in its approach and its message. This is a remarkable text that teaches both the disciples and we as a church what we are to do in this world. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And why they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it 
gave the water that he sent to them. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Here is the Holy Gospel. Which place join me in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and all the invisible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God.
such a dangerous effect of the chromosome. The disciples were exactly what they were. They were sinful men who needed I can put out a lot of things, but not that. I'm sorry. Now, the Lord gives this perspective. The disciples are all in this room, and the Lord wanted to bring them from this state of nothingness to empowerment. And so he just shows up in the room. And to show the level that they were at, they were scared, they were frightened, and then they thought they saw it. And Jesus, I could just see his face, and I can, in this context, noise. Are you kidding me? Because he says, look at me. Look at me. Touch me. I'm real. And so they touch him. And they look at his hands, and they look at his feet, and the scripture tells us they were so excited, but they didn't believe that. They were just excited because he wasn't a ghost. What state of mind were these people at? They can't recognize the Lord. He's talking to them. They're not grasping it. They're a little slow. The disciples were normal human beings who have doubts unless God does one thing and one thing very holy. Opens their minds. So as he showed them and it didn't read, he did something that they had done together many times. He says, do you have anything to eat? And with that, they started really realizing that Jesus was actually there. They were just quick men. But the Lord broke through. Because he had a mission for them. He had chosen each of these men to be the ones who were going to go out into the world and share the message of the gospel. He had to open up their minds and grant to them Wonder. So he says, look at all that I taught you. From the prophets, from the Psalms, from all the Old Testament, look at what I taught you. And when he gave them this insight, there started to be a transformation in them. They started to go from ignorance to wisdom. They went from fear to hope. And they started to grasp that the Lord was really in their presence. Now the comfort I have is that these disciples reflect the fact that God is really patient with us. He goes to extraordinary lengths in order to give them wisdom, which means he will go to extraordinary lengths to give us wisdom. Because we need the Spirit to give us a wisdom that is beyond our mind. I know I'm slower than most people, I understand. But this is something that I have never figured out, and maybe you understand it perfectly. But how is it that when you turn the TV on, the picture comes on the TV when it's just waves from the air? Do you understand what I'm asking? How many of you understand the integral part of how the TV works? One. How many of the rest of you punch it or click it and expect it to work and don't care how it works? Awesome. Now, this is our state. We have very little knowledge We'll still punch that TV. What does it show us? How much we need our God to give us wisdom. How much we need our God to give us His Spirit so that we can grasp what we cannot grasp on our own. Because we are not that bright. Our Lord has this desire for his body. It's that we support each other. That we pray for each other. That we study the scripture on behalf of each other. That we 
help people stand up when they have fallen down, that we give them comfort when they are hurting, that we are ones who reach out and bless each other. The only way this ever happens is if the Spirit transforms the minds and the hearts of each of us to fulfill the role that He created for us to fulfill. Every single one of us has a different gift. It is a unique gift. It's not supposed to be the same gift. It's not supposed to compete between each other. It's a unique gift given to us by God. But we need each other because we are the body of Christ. We need collectively to make a concerted effort to seek the Lord's guidance in building us up, to use the gift we have been given, to strengthen each other. Prayer is the most remarkable gift. It brings a blessing into the lives of other people. And it is not just a little thing, it is a huge one. Just one of the tools the Lord gives us. He stresses upon us as a body of believers, we should never give up his truths. His word is always exactly what it is. Holy, divine, sacred, never has an error, always provides wisdom, enlightens, overwhelms, and then imparts to us his grace. His word is what everyone who is a believer and a part of the body of Christ needs to look at frequently so that the word strengthens their ability to do whatever it is that God has assigned them in the body of Christ. We do not know without his guidance. We cannot just go, oh, this is my job. The Lord has to show us this. Every one of us. That's why he asked us as a church to hold certain principles that we will never back away from. There's only one Savior that came through Christ. He shed his blood. He rose from the dead. He has given us life. It's called the gospel. There's only one gospel in this world. There are not three. There are not twelve. There is only one. It is a gospel given to us by Jesus himself. Shown to us in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It never changes. I have read it a thousand times. It's never changed one time. It's the same every single time. Because God is assuring us that in that gospel, we have to get to life. And there is no one. He has given us this thing called the office of the ministry. It's an office given to you. It was given to you because God is brilliant and he knows that you are more trustworthy than you can be. And he sincerely trusts you a whole lot more than you trust him. You understood this because when you gave me a call, you, you called me to this church to serve as your pastor, but you also made it very clear, I have nothing here as far as power. I am called an ex officio member of this congregation. I am not a member of this congregation. I have no ability to vote. I have no ability to do anything. I only work here until you go, leave. Because it's not my office. And the Lord trusts you a whole lot more than he trusts me. He has set up things so that you will be protected and so that the body will grow. He has placed into our presence these remarkable things called His means of grace, His sacraments. He chose two ways that He wanted to come to us and personally smack us in our heart. He chose the means so that they would be perfect, they would be divine, they would be sacred, and they would apply to us exactly what God wanted them. So He took it out of our hands and He Himself did it. And a baptismal font is not about anything except God coming and making a promise. He makes a promise to the child. He applies to the child, the adult, whoever is baptized, all the promises that he has given and applies it to them in a way that is a big word called efficacious. It's effect. Then we go to the Lord's Supper. We receive our risen Lord. There is not any doubt. It is a logic. It is spiritual. 
It is true. He knows that we need to be uplifted and blessed and strengthened and renewed and restored and given a new sight and touched by a spirit so that we have wisdom that we don't have. And we need it frequently because we tend to forget. And so he comes and he comes and he comes and he comes to lift us up over and over and over again because he wants this body to be strengthened in him. The Lord has given us this right to support each other, to pray for each other, to have a mind that expands out so that we actually start noticing what other people are in need. Everything that the Lord gives us is so that we as a body of believers will grow in strength. Everything is set up so that we look outward, not inward, and that we understand the wonder of what he has done. That is what he came to teach the disciples. He said, I am the one who has come. I point you to my Father, and the Spirit is going to come into your heart. The triune God desires that we are blessed. And so he has taken the actions. And I love what he has done. I love the fact that he has handled everything because we can't handle anything. He shows us this with the disciples. These were bright men. They had spent almost three years with the Lord. They knew everything. He had explained it to them over and over again. They're in a room hiding. And he comes in and he goes, hey, how you doing? And when they look at him like, you're a ghost. He doesn't go, are you nuts? He simply goes, look at this, guys. Look at me. Let me show you. Look at me. Look at me. I'm here. I'm real. Let me eat a piece of fish. Will that convince you? The answer was, yeah. Never seen anybody convinced about God on a piece of fish before, but we see it in the gospel. It just shows the Lord understands what we need to be in Christ. He has placed every piece with each of us that we need to bring us strength to each other. That is what we are raising our hearts and minds to, the Lord so we can make us strengthen each other. It is such a remarkable gift to know what He gives us the right to do. And so by His grace and His work, He will enlighten us to do just that. May God lead us to truly bless and bring us strength to each other, as only we can.
continue to bless them, strengthen their hearts and minds, keep your health and goodness upon them, and guide them in all that they do. For Janet C. For Janet, we thank you, gracious Father, for the many lives that you have enabled her to touch, for the drive that you have given her to continue to reach out and bless the lives of others. We ask that you would continue to bless her as she has reached out to her children and grandchildren in the many ways that you have enabled her to find joy and goodness in them. Hold her close to you, dear Lord, and guide her each day, and enrich her to, to enable her to enrich the lives of many others. For the snows, for Jeff and Devin. For Jeff and Devin, we thank you, gracious Father, for the life that you have given them together, for the blessing of their children and their grandchild, and the way that you have enabled them to support and love each other. May you continue, dear Lord, to enrich and bless them each day, and by their hearts, ever closer. For Mary's Father, we ask, gracious Lord, that you would be near him, that you would grant him patience, that you would enable him to have a blessing of his pain, and that you would provide healing. May you truly, dear Lord, grant him a goodness and carry him through this time. For Charlotte, we thank you, gracious Father, for the help that she is receiving, for the fact that her heart was only minimally affected by this heart attack. And so we ask now that you would grant her your strength, that you would carry her forward, and enable her very soon to return to normal activity. For Pam, we rejoice, dear Lord, as a success of her surgery, for the health that has been extended to her. We ask now that you would grant her patience, that you would provide her healing, that you would help her go through her therapy, and enable her to return to her normal activity. For Rachel, for her family, we ask Grace to follow the hope of the resurrection. We thank you for the promise that you have given, for the spirit that you have imparted, and for the blessings that you have granted to them. And may you, dear Lord, provide them that special comfort and carry them through this time, and we do rejoice in the light that you have given to Greg. So, Jenny, I thank you for being here, for carrying her through her surgery, for blessing her with now having the strength given to her once again, and may your healing power be upon her, and that you in each day use your pain. For Diane, we thank you for the progress that has been made, and we ask that you would continue to keep her healthy and strong and move her forward. For Bob, that you would continue to touch him and bless him and keep him under your care. For Curtis, that each day you would lift him up and grant him that special presence. And so as your heart remain before you are military men and women, asking that you would walk with them, provide them your guidance and direction and your wisdom, and keep them ever close to you. And as your people, dear Lord, we are truly privileged to turn to you, and we do this morning once again in the prayer that your son is about to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
John forever. He is dealing with uh, cancer that is winning. And so um, I will offer blessings to John, John and then we will have a closing talk. Gracious Father, you are a God of mercy and wonder who comes into our presence to enlighten our hearts and to bless our spirits. And John, we ask that you would do just that. It is only through your grace and mercy and wonder of your love and how the strength that you offer that he can deal with all that he is facing. May you truly with your spirit uplift him in his heart so his trust and his understanding is bound in your love. May you truly, dear Lord, enrich him if it is your will to heal him. Of your privilege this day to place them to your hands, trusting in what you will do, and thank you now for the blessings that you will bestow. As we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we employ you that of your mercy. You have strengthened us with the same faith towards you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his confidence upon you and grant to you his eternal peace.